tragic accident or calculated murder. Now let's see the elevations. Investigators reopen a 55-year-old mystery. This was a major world event. Oh, no, Grace! Grace! What caused a crash that killed the UN Secretary General? It was devastating. This gentleman was a champion of world peace. How did a top secret peace mission in Africa end in death? It's tough to see how they could have screwed this up. Certain people believe it's just not possible that Doug Hammarskjöld was killed in a common accident. It had to be something more. Controversial theories abound. Doug Hammarskjöld was murdered. Period. But the truth may finally be within reach. As an investigator, I don't want to close any doors. Swedish air crash investigator Sven Hammerberg is entering a world of intrigue and deadly Cold War conspiracies. A special commission reporting to the UN needs him to determine whether a 1961 air disaster was an accident or an assassination. Well, the commission knew that I had some experience in that field of old aircraft accidents, so uh, they called me. The pressure is on to get to the bottom of an aviation history that's as controversial today as it was 55 years ago. There's a wide range of things that have never ever been adequately considered. They might not bring the ultimate truth, but it requires to look carefully again. Hammerberg studies the events from the night of the fateful flight. A United Nations transport plane, the Albertina, is on a vital mission in Central Africa. Estimate of B Mandola at 2347, arrival time 0020. The destination is Ndola Airport in the British colony of Northern Rhodesia. Roger, Ndola Web of a slight smoke haze. Controllers and local dignitaries anxious. They await the arrival of one of the most important people in the world. Set altimeter to 30.15. Roger. Request descent clearance at 57. Roger, 57. Clear to descend to 6,000 feet. On board the DC 6 is UN Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld. At least they're willing to talk. What else do we know about their latest demands? He's flying in from the Congo to hold high-level peace talks with a rebel leader. Hammarskjöld and most likely members of his entourage on board were pretty aware that this is a difficult mission. It was a secretary general for whom a physical risk was integral part of his job. All right. Descending to 6,000. Traffic ahead. 6,000. Yes, sir. The captain is 35-year-old Per Hallenquist. Our visibility should be pretty good once we get down there. 29-year-old Lars Litten is Hallenquist's first officer. The life of flying a transport airplane in the Congo during the 1960s, during the decolonization era, was indeed uh, a fantastic challenge for everyone. Former pilot and NTSB investigator. Robert McIntosh flew transport missions for the UN throughout the 60s. During my time in the Congo, I was probably a lucky guy because there were mercenaries around and I never found any bullet holes in the aircraft that I was flying. 7,000. All right. Give me 2,000 RPM and 20 inches. You don't have to set the altitude. That's 5,000 feet, but we'll have the runway in sight long before then. The flight left the Congolese capital Leopoldville a little more than six hours ago. For security reasons, it's flown an indirect route to Ndola. 
they made arrangements in the route of the plane to avoid any unpleasant surprises. Number one, we need to extend the ceasefire. We can't be seen as being the enemy here. To prevent an ambush, no flight plan has been filed, and the pilots have maintained radio silence for most of the flight. The mission is a closely guarded secret. I am proceeding to Salisbury after Dola. Negative. Even at this late stage, the crew needs to be secretive about who might be listening in. Negative. Due to barking difficulties, would like to know your intentions. We will give them on the ground. Roger. The security of the airport and of uh, the uh, flying environment uh, was sometimes in question. Uh, there were there were opportunities for uh, counter forces to uh, perhaps uh, shoot at aircraft that were on final approach. Free descent checklist, please. Anti collision lights. On. Head check. Okay. Speed to one eight zero knots. the pilots are much longer than we land. The Secretary General and his delegation should be on the ground in about 10 minutes. Your light's in sight. Overhead, Endola. Descend it. Uh, Roger. Before reaching 6,000 feet. Roger. Okay, about 10 minutes away. Because of the unusual flight path, the plane now needs to fly past Andola Airport and circle back to touch down on its only runway. Andola was uh, a bit, uh, we say, out in the sticks with a little control tower and uh, with some uh, surrounding hills. And certainly at night it was uh, extremely difficult to make approaches there. 180 knots, sir. Speed is good, thank you. You certainly have to be extremely vigilant. Uh, to the hazards uh, around such a small airport. The crew begins the final swooping left-hand turn that will line them up with the runway below. The mission to Ndola is about to begin. A mission that could change the fate of nations. The United Nations Security Council meeting again to deal with the difficult and dangerous Congo situation. It was resolved to call upon Belgium to withdraw her troops from... The Congo in the early 60s was uh, of utmost priority in the Cold War. It was of top tier strategic importance. The Congo recently won its independence from Belgium. But the new nation's southern region of Katanga has declared itself an independent state. A bloody civil war has erupted. And with the world's richest uranium union are backing opposing factions. The risk of a global catastrophe is very real. One needs to recall that the nuclear bombs that were thrown on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were supplied with uranium from Katanga. Hammarskjöld hopes to resolve the deadly conflict and help reunite the Congo. But on the ground in Ndola, controllers are growing concerned. Albertina, Ndola Tower, do you read? The Secretary General's plane is overdue. Where did the aircraft go? Why, uh, why have we not seen it? Albertina, Ndola Tower, please acknowledge. Where are you? Uh, why am I not hearing from you? That would have been very present in the minds of a controller at that point in time. The controller contacts other airports in the region. Salisbury, Endola Airport. Have you had any word from the UN Albertina? Nothing at all. Perhaps the Albertina's secret mission has taken it to a different destination at the last minute. Lusaka, Endola Airport. Have you had any contact with the UN flight? Negative. No contact here. The plane carrying one of the most important men on the planet is missing. It's a mystery that will haunt Ndola and the world 
for decades to come. By dawn, news of the UN Secretary General's disappearance is spreading fast. We heard that he was missing. So, what were we to do? Um, we weren't going to sit around and do uh... Clyde Sanger covered Hammarskjöld's mission in Africa for the Guardian newspaper. A number of journalists got together and chartered a plane and flew over the area and spotted where the plane had come down. On the side of a hill, nine miles west of the airport, journalists spot a gash in the trees. And it was quite broad. It had cut through a lot of trees. And it was an open space like that with stumps of trees. Whatever went wrong in the skies above, the flight clearly ended with a violent impact, followed by intense fire. When local authorities arrive, they find bodies surrounded by badly scorched wreckage. And uh, so we had only a distant view. They found a quite a large fuselage in one place, which we could see. And um, we were told afterwards that Dag Hammarskjöld was killed. For over eight years, Dag Hammarskjöld spoke for and personified the United Nations Organization. An economist from Sweden, he took over from Secretary General. The Secretary General had been a, a very famous guy, a champion of world peace. So this was a major world event. I know that I'm speaking for all of my fellow Americans, expressing our deep sense of shock and loss in the untimely death of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Dag Hammarskjöld. With the loss of Dag Hammarskjöld and his delegation, prospects for peace in the Congo fade. Regional power brokers have no interest in following through on the Secretary General's mission. His mission to uh, continue to attempt to reunite uh, the province uh, that he was concerned with, Katanga province, uh, was counter to the interests of uh, a lot of people. I think it's pretty obvious that there were a plethora of interests out there who were not really mourning the death of Hamasha. The Cold War politics surrounding the flight to Indola lead many to speculate that the Secretary General's plane was shot down. Was there anyone who wanted to see Hammarskjöld dead? Where do you want me to start and where to end? The world may soon learn more about the crash from a surprising source. Incredibly, there is a sole survivor. Against all odds, a 36-year-old UN security officer lived through the heavy impact and raging fire. Harold Julian is in critical condition, but if he can recover and tell his story, he might provide valuable evidence. While they wait to hear what Julian will say, Rhodesian government investigators begin searching for clues in the wreckage. They face a daunting task. About 80% of the fuselage is completely melted. Every air safety investigator has a given set of things that he's really looking for. He wants to find out if the whole airplane is there. Is there something missing? He's looking for the tail, he's looking for the wing tips, he's looking for the uh, power plants, etc. All those basic things are elemental. That's it, guys. Slow and meticulous. Amidst the burnt wreckage, there are also personal effects. Poignant reminders of lives cut short. Even these can help investigators learn more. Wristwatches damaged by the sudden impact reveal the exact time of the crash. 12.13. The Secretary General's plane hit the ground three minutes after its last radio transmission. What happened in those three minutes? Where were they in those three minutes? Do we have witnesses? Do we have a, a direction? What can we tell happened there? And indeed, was there a, a possibility of some interdiction uh, from an, an outside force? Uh, perhaps a ground fire, uh, somebody trying to shoot down the airplane or from the air. It 
Flight's in sight. Overhead and Dola descending. Critical questions about the flight's final moments will not be answered by a voice or data recorder. The DC-6 was not equipped with either. The only chance of getting a first-hand account about what happened rests with the badly injured UN security officer. Dig said. Go back. Harold Julian's few brief words are astounding. It blew up. He suggests that the plane blew up before it crashed. We need to go back. Then there was the crash. He was not in good shape after the accident. Uh, he had uh, heavy medicine and so on. So um, it's hard to, uh, to measure the value of his statement. Investigators hope Julian will provide more details after he recovers, but he never does. He dies five days after the accident. Did it really blow up before the crash, like he said? Could a missile or bomb have taken down the Secretary General's plane? The Separatist rebels do have a fighter jet capable of shooting down a DC-6. The region. The Fuga could have been waiting for the DC-6. They could have used force. Investigators study the pilot's handbook for the Fuga. They discover that the fighter's maximum combat range is 419 kilometers, or 260 miles. It's a key finding, because the nearest fighter base is almost 425 kilometers away. There's no way a fighter jet took off from this base, shot down a plane here, and then made it back to the base safely. The possibility of a Fuga fighter in the middle of the night uh, finding this air aircraft, uh, shooting it down, uh, returning to its base, it didn't fit the conditions that were there on that given night. Investigators study the metal skin of the DC-6, looking for any evidence that it was ripped open by machine gun fire or a missile. They find none. Going a step further, they test ash from the crash site for the presence of explosives. They tried to look for it. They, uh, they divided the metal parts in small pieces and so on and they didn't find anything in that way. What's more, when investigators study key pieces of wreckage from the DC-6, everything points to a plane that was coming in for a routine landing. Gear down, flaps out. These guys are getting ready to land. Flaps 30, flaps 30. The landing gear was down, the flaps were extended, Okay, speed down to 120 knots. If there had been an attack, uh, they would have wanted to get the heck out of there. And uh, consequently, uh, the evidence just doesn't speak of an attack uh, from ground or air. Despite all the rumors, Rhodesian investigators can find nothing pointing to foul play. The cause of the crash that killed 16 people on a secret UN mission remains a mystery. Going down! Going down, Greg! Greg! Eleven days after the accident in Ndola, dignitaries from around the world gather in Dag Hammarskjöld's hometown of Uppsala for a state funeral. The wreath... It was devastating. Hammarskjöld was a person of utmost integrity. He believed in justice. He believed in equality. He believed in solidarity. Digging into the Albertina's maintenance records, investigators make a disturbing find. Bullet hole in engine number two. 
That's not something you see every day. Just hours before the DC-6 took off in Dola, the plane was hit by gunfire. There were issues with uh, uh, groups that would uh, fire at aircraft on the ground, trying to uh, disrupt things. Mechanics repaired damage to an engine, and the plane was deemed fit to fly. The discovery leads investigators to wonder. So, just how badly damaged was that engine? Number two. I need max power number one. Max on wood. Perhaps the damaged engine failed at a critical moment, causing the Albertina to suddenly lose altitude. If the theory is right, investigators should be able to confirm it by taking a close look at the propeller blades. We have to check each and every one, see if there was indications of bending on those propeller blades as they as they entered the forest. These things must have been spinning mighty fast to chew up this amount of wood. The damage to the blades leaves no doubt. They were spinning normally when they hit the trees. They're all uh, quite uh, symmetrical and uh, indicative of power plants uh, that were fully operational as the uh, as the crash took place well it can't be engine failure the bullet damage to the engine did not cause the crash according to the chart it should have been 6,000 feet here Next, investigators study the navigational chart for Undola. The top of the hill is 4,300 feet. They calculate the altitude the Albertina should have been flying at when it crashed. Add 70 feet for the trees. That means he should have been nearly 1,700. At the crash site, damage to the trees shows that the plane traveled forward for more than 750 feet before coming to rest. That distance means the plane hit the treetops at a shallow angle while descending gradually. The plane went down in the trees in, uh, in a gentle angle, uh, just like uh, before landing. The yeah, control, look for the lights. Roger. Investigators wonder when did things start to go wrong for the crew? How did the Albertina get too low? The transcript says inside overhead Nadola descending Roger report reaching 6,000 the radio conversation between the pilots and the controller clearly shows that the crew had the airport in sight from a safe altitude less than 10 minutes before hitting the ground your lights in sight overhead and Dola. so you know he's right here when he spots the airport at around 6,000 feet but the train reveals something more a single unexpected word send it the albertina was already descending when it flew past the airport it's a crucial lead he's continuing to shed altitude here and keeps descending until he hits the hill here at an altitude of 4290 feet for some reason the Pilots began their descent much too early. It's unfathomable that uh, there was any intention to be below 5,000 feet at that point in the, in the approach. Investigators are at a loss to explain how the pilots ended up misjudging their altitude so badly. Something threw them off. What? They consider the possibility that the crew was misled by an incorrect altimeter reading. Estimate of B Mandola at 2347. Arrival time 0020. Half an hour before he expects to land, Hollenquist makes contact with the tower in Andola. Roger. Controllers give him an important piece of information. Set to meter 230.15. Roger. Pilots need to calibrate their altimeters for every airport they land at, factoring in the runway's height above sea level. 
the settings of the barometric pressure around the airfield were provided by the tower, and that needed to be uh, translated from uh, millibars to uh, inches. They examined the instruments, looking for any sign that the crew dialed in the wrong altimeter setting for Indola. A set of numbers showing barometric pressure provides an answer. The investigators checked the three altimeters in the plane. They found that uh, the altimeters were working at the time and correctly set. There was nothing wrong with the altimeters. It's another dead end. What do we focus on next? While crash investigators continue to search for answers, medical examiners make an astonishing discovery. It looks like some of the passengers suffered gunshot wounds. Finding bodies in the wreckage with bullet wounds is, of course, uh, very interesting to look into. Perhaps there's a sinister cause to this accident, after all. Investigators sift through dirt from the crash site where a critical UN peace mission ended in flames. They find more evidence of gunfire, shell casings, and a total of 342 bullets recovered from the bodies of the victims or nearby. Were they fired on board the plane or from outside? Investigators need to know. Ballistics experts work to find the answer. When a bullet passes through the barrel of a gun, it spins. The spinning action marks the bullet with telltale marks called rifling. But ballistic testing reveals yet another surprise. None of the bullets have any signs of rifling. They were never fired from any gun. We tested every one. The persons uh, who were wounded by the bullets also carried bullets uh, because they were like guards. So they, they had ammunition uh, on them. The investigation shows that the most likely cause of the wounds is that the bullets somehow uh, exploded and went into the, the bodies. Rhodesian investigators conclude the bullets likely exploded in the heat of the post-crash fire and were prepared into nearby bodies. Without any evidence of sabotage or attack, nor any sign like pilot error. These guys are experienced. It's tough to see how they could have screwed this up. Could the crew have somehow been distracted in the final moments of flight? A discovery on day one of the investigation lends support to that idea. When rescuers searched the wreckage, they found evidence that a UN bodyguard was in the cockpit at the time of the crash. But this is the cockpit area, and we found the security officer's body here. Of course, the pilots are much longer than we might have. A visitor in the cockpit can be dangerously distracting for a crew. Especially when they're close to the ground. We'll be on the ground in three minutes. It's a few minutes early. Flaps 30. Flaps 30. You have to pay attention to small movements on, on the instruments. You can have your guys standing by if you want. Your attention to detail, to the altitude of your altitude awareness, needs to be extremely high. I'll stop short of the terminal. You can have the Secretary General disembark there. The margins are very small. It's a matter of seconds before... investigators the evidence is clear the pilots simply lost track of their altitude and flew their plane into the ground no sabotage no missiles no murder they go into the, the questions about sabotage and, and uh, attacks but they conclude that the most uh, probable uh, cause to the accident is some kind of uh, pilot error 
Those who believe this was an assassination aren't swayed by the official findings. It's a big thing when a Secretary General of the United Nations dies in a aeroplane crash. A very big thing. Certain people believe it's just not possible that Doug Hammarskjöld was killed uh, in, a, in a common accident. It had to be something more. But three subsequent reports on the crash all agree there's no evidence of an assassination. The Hammarskjöld file is closed. Then, in 2011, 50 years after the crash, stunning Southall, a former U.S. intelligence officer with an astounding story. Southall was working in a signals monitoring base in Cyprus the night Hammarskjöld's plane went down. I see the transport plane coming low. He claims he heard a remarkable recording. I'm going down to make a run on it. What could be the voice of a pilot launching an attack on the Albertina? Yes, it's the Transair DC-6. There is a possibility that there was a listening station uh, recording the radio transmissions and sending them to the NSA. I did it. There are flames, it's crashing. Is this proof of what really happened? Evidence of a cold-blooded assassination of the UN Secretary General? There's more to the NSA officer's intriguing story about the mysterious radio call on the night of the crash. Going down to make a run on it. He says the voice on the recording that night was not unknown. It was identified as a notorious Belgian pilot a mercenary who flew Magister fighter planes for the rebel Katanga Air Force. The night that the plane was actually shot down, um, I was working a night shift. Paul Abram was also with the NSA at the time, stationed on the island of Crete. He claims he heard a similar radio call. The NSA was telling us on a daily basis, these are the places that Hammerskull will probably travel, these are the frequencies that the ground stations would be using here is the tail number of his plane the idea being that they wanted to know how close he was to signing a peace agreement and for us to know exactly where he was going and what he was doing i'm going down to make a run on it on september 18th 1961 the most important chatter came down to we have the plane in sight yes we've checked it's the plane i did it it's going down. The shoot-down theory is given added weight when Williams reviews witness statements that the original investigation discounted as unreliable. They describe a second plane approaching the Secretary General's DC-6 at great speed, guns firing. Dag Hammerskjold was murdered. Period. He was shot down. Williams lays out her shocking theory in an eye-opening book. Stopped short of a definite conclusion. All the book wanted to achieve and it managed to achieve is to say there are a lot of questions which are not yet sufficiently answered. The book's stunning claims lead to action. In 2013, Sven Hammerburg joins a new search for the truth gathering evidence to be presented to the United Nations. My task was to look into the details uh, and see if there were any new information available. And I was asked to evaluate the investigations that had been performed before. He's part of a special commission of inquiry. It includes a group of distinguished judges who travel to Andola to meet witnesses from the night of the crash. Many repeat their claim they saw two planes in the air over Ndola. I think most importantly, there are still eyewitnesses, and many of them seem to be very credible eyewitnesses, who were just ignored. Could the death of the UN Secretary General really be an assassination? Hammerberg digs deeper, trying to answer that question once and for all. When I look into the 
basic facts around the crash. I look at the trees and the crash site and um, the statements over radio and so on. Okay. Now let's see the elevations. He studies the terrain around Ndola Airport. He notes the height of the hills. He compares what he finds to what's shown on the chart used by the UN pilots. And he makes a shocking discovery. There's a hill here. A hill here. A hill here. There's nothing marked here. Here. Where the crash site is. The Andola chart does not show any obstacle or higher ground uh, west of the field. The local terrain includes hills west of Andola that rise to over 4,300 feet. But they're missing from the chart. This hill could have blocked his view of the runway. The crew might have been unaware of the height west of the field since there were, were no signs of it. He discovers that members of the crew flying the Secretary General to high level peace talks have been on duty for 17 of the past 24 hours. That's a long day for these guys. Fatigue is an important factor here. The flight had last for six and a half hours. And there are signs that some of the crew were uh, quite exhausted even before the flight. All right. Descend into 6,000, no traffic ahead. 6,000, yes, sir. For Hammerberg, the clues are beginning to add up. He feels close to solving a 50-year-old aviation mystery that has generated heated controversy the world over. After carefully reviewing all the evidence surrounding the crash of the Albertina in 1961, Sven Hummerberg believes he now knows what went wrong in the final three minutes of flight. And it has nothing to do with murder. Overhead, Adola. Descend it. Reaching the airfield, see the lights, when you have been flying for six and a half hours, I think it's very easy for a pilot to get thinking that, oh, we are here. We're just going to land. Passing the airport, the pilots descend below the minimum safe altitude of 5,000 feet. 4,500. As they turn back towards the runway, they suddenly lose sight of the runway lights. What the hell? You go into the dark, and then you completely uh, miss your references. And that is a dangerous situation. I don't have the runway in sight. The pilots don't realize that a hill is blocking their view. Because the hill isn't on their chart. Losing the visual sight of the airport would cause the pilots to look even further and lose more altitude. Before they even know they're in danger, it's too late. A fatigued crew, descending too soon, over hilly terrain that wasn't marked on their chart. Those factors combined to cause the fatal crash. I think that's all the ingredients of a control flight into terrain. They are there. With uh, uh, education and equipment that we have, there are still cases where we have uh, a control flight into terrain. To finally put the issue to rest, there's one last piece of evidence that investigators want to see. NSA records from the night of the crash. They asked uh, the NSA to release uh, these documents and the answer was that uh, they remain classified as top secret and will not be released. Given my knowledge of the recordings, tape logs, uh, facsimiles, etc., that they have concerning this incident, 
I'm not the least surprised that they haven't been released. Uh, it's just in their nature. It's been more than 50 years since the mysterious crash in Andola. Without the NSA documents, doubts about the crash still linger. But efforts to uncover the truth continue. For me personally, the biggest reason that justifies all these efforts that there are still family members, relatives, close colleagues, who still live with the Dao. Though Hamashal died before he could stop the fighting in Katanga, many believe his efforts prevented the conflict from raging out of control. If it wouldn't have been for Hamashal's intervention in the Congo, it could have easily escalated into a third world war. Just a few months after his death, Dag Hammarskjöld became the first person to be honored posthumously with the Nobel Peace Prize. We should remember Dag Hammarskjöld and the others as human beings who were willing to risk their lives on a dangerous mission to contribute to more peace on our Earth.